sometimes just the way you talk about something, when you make it mentionable, when you take away the shame from it, you take away the whole secrecy, and you just talk about it, not like it's no big deal, but rather like it is part of life, and therefore it's okay to talk about, that itself makes people feel heard. Meaning they didn't actually go tell you, but they know that if they did have to tell you, you would be able to hear them because you've already put it out on the table and made it a fair topic of discussion. What I asked, is Rabbi Chase have a therapist? You asked Chet? You yeah, just, I just started the, yeah, it was a few minutes ago. All right. Rabbi Chase Taub is not a licensed psychologist. Oh, you got it right. Mm. But he but. is, <laughs> having said that, he is a renowned speaker, author, and teacher if we could do a screen share, I would. Maybe I'll share some screenshots. But anyone could probably do this. I assume they'll get the same uh, responses. Yeah. Um, he's a renowned speaker, author, and teacher on topics related to mental health, addiction, and spirituality. He has written several books on these topics and has given numerous talks and workshops on them. Although he does not have a formal degree in psychology, he has studied and written extensively on topics related to psychology particularly in the context of Jewish spirituality I'm and really mysticism. how accurate this is. And then I asked, why do does, why does so many people assume he is a psychologist? Oh, wow. It is possible that some people assume Rabbi Shea Staub is a psychologist because he often speaks and writes about topics related to mental health and addiction, which are areas commonly associated with psychology. Additionally, his approach to these topics incorporate a deep understanding of Jewish spirituality and mysticism which may lead some people to assume that he has training in both psychology and Jewish studies. However, it is important to note that while Rabbi Shastow is highly knowledgeable and experienced in these areas, he is not a licensed th uh, psychologist or mental health professional. It is always important to seek out the advice and guidance of trained I professionals that, when dealing with issues related to mental health and addiction. And then I asked, is that to suggest that Judaism and spirituality <laughs> Is separate from mental health? No, no, not at all. Judaism and spiritual. No, hold on. Yeah. He said no, not at all. No, not at all. Why are you assuming the gender of ChatGPT? Just yeah. Okay. ChatGPT said no, not at all. Yeah. Okay. It just sounds. You know what? Emphatic. We can put it on. The can I look at it? Yeah. I just I want to make sure you're not making this up. No. Okay. No, not at all. Judaism, Judaism and spirituality can certainly be an important part of an individual's mental health and overall well-being. In fact, for many people, spirituality and religious practices can be a valuable source of support and meaning. However, it is important to recognize that mental health issues are complex and often require specialized training and expertise to address effectively. While spiritual practices can be an important part of a person's overall mental health care, they should not be seen as a substitute for evidence-based treatments. Could we, we have to censor that for the CO. No, that's okay. right. Uh, as a substitute for evidence-based treatments such as therapy and medication when needed. It isn't right. also important. So here's what, okay, I, there's a lot to, uh, uh, it's so meta because you were talking with Yankel about the idea of seeing, and you were shared that anecdote from Dr. Tversky of appreciating therapy or as a tool rather than a source, or if Viktor Frankl put it, there is the how and the why. And right. when people turn to a therapist for the why instead of the how, and not ironically, you see the same pattern of so the same person then turning to the rabbi for the how, and you deal with that, and that's why we're talking about this. He who will turn to the therapist for the why will ultimately turn to the rabbi for ah, the how. You heard it here first. I don't um, even know. I, by the way, I should just major disclaimer: don't memify that or anything. I don't even know if I agree uh, with that statement. I was just there I is heard a you say it, yeah. and I just smoothed it out for you. There is a book. That statement was about as um, intel no intelligent as ChatGPT. Meaning, ChatGPT is <laughs> that's a, the level of creativity that it's capable you know, of. ChatGPT is good at one thing: speaking in a smooth, convincing way, but it doesn't necessarily have any meaning behind it. You know what it's like? It's like slam poetry. Chat GBT is sounds great, but right. it doesn't mean as soon as you like break it down, right, take out some of the like sort of rhyme, it's like right. actually that made no sense. I'm not even sure why I applauded just now. <laughs> uh, no, pick that mic right back up. Right. Do not drop it ever again. Right. That was terrible. But yeah. this is interesting. So, so you're, you're I was okay. talking to the tool about why we associate 
why we attribute ultimate meanings or spiritual meaning to people or things that are really only in the business or ought to be in the business of how. Yeah. And I would love to delve into how and why we often confuse those two. This is a great book. If I had to predict, we, we did a segment last time about um, books that might have been found in the Tao household bookshelf. You were pretty much wrong on nine out of ten of your guests. I got some of those 80s. My brother does uh, on, and you, yeah, you had to guess. Well, let's. Uh, what about this one? Carl Menninger, Whatever Became of Sin? I'm not familiar with it. The, the <laughs> theme of the book Sorry. is the Menninger Institute in Kansas City, and the he was making the point in the book that you know, if rabbis would be rabbis, then not there wouldn't be as many people coming to his center and to him for uh, his services. You know, so anyway, the vacuum sort of thing that was created. So I want to get <laughs> – there's a lot I wanted to get to. There's some well, really interesting stuff. Chat, chat, see, see, yeah, you have two minutes. <laughs> oh, two minutes. Have to... I can't read all my pages of chat. GP. You were I... doing that all while I was talking to Yanko Raskin the whole – Okay, and then you. Yeah. All right. So what's <laughs> some of it is repetitive, but it's actually not. Okay, there's some funny stuff here, but it's gonna have to wait. I do want to say this. There's something heavy that came up before, and uh, I never shared this story with you. I only shared it like maybe I'm not sure with who, but and now you're about to share it with like a thousand. And it's maybe answers the rhetorical question of why do why are people surprised to hear that you're not a therapist when you say certain things. Okay. And it directly dovetails with some of the parenting stuff that we start with, and I think it brings it full circle. Uh, maybe eight or nine, about nine years ago, I attended a retreat and a support group for, um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was another, let's we'll say like a, someone from a, or an Orthodox family. He was in his early 50s. And um, in the group, he shared about sexual abuse that happened uh, by a sixth grade teacher. And he said he either shared about it once before with a therapist, but never in a group setting. And I won't go into some of the details of what was shared, but in like a very sort of muted uh, voice, he was like mummering something. And then once he repeated it, he kept saying, and I couldn't tell anyone. I couldn't tell anyone. I couldn't tell anyone. And um, it was over the course of you know, 40 minutes or so, but what he shared a bit later, and obviously um, from what we know about abuse, and so, so much of it is in the more than the event itself, the uh, shame and the isolation, shame and isolation yeah. from not having where anyone you know, to call. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he explained a bit more what he meant by I couldn't tell anyone. He said he was a child of a Holocaust survivor who remarried after he came to America and sort of had a child later in life. And his, uh, he didn't really have a, that much of a relationship with his, with his birth mother. He lived with his father, and his father was uh, deaf and dumb. If I'm not mistaken, he said as a result of what he experienced in the camps. And it was a very revealing story, I thought, because it wasn't um, <laughs> a figure of speech when he said, I, could, I couldn't, right? He literally couldn't. Um, and Couldn't tell his father because his father couldn't even hear him. Right. Wow. So they were talking tonight about a community that's healing in so many different ways and individually, collectively, and parents trying to become better parents, learning. Uh, but it, it like starts with just like the acceptance of. So can, can I just speak to that? This is very heavy, but I, I just want to. I don't have the ability or desire to actually, and, and I can't, I couldn't even fathom. I can't hear everybody's pain. I can't. I mean, even the amount that I already hear takes a huge toll on me. But what I do try to do, and I believe it helps, 
and we can all do this and it'll help even more is sometimes just the way you talk about something when you make it mentionable when you take away the shame from it you take away the whole secrecy and you just talk about it not like it's no big deal but rather like it is part of life and therefore it's okay to talk about that itself makes people feel heard meaning they didn't actually go tell you they didn't but they know that if they did have to tell you you would be able to hear them because it's you've already put it out on the table and made it a fair topic of discussion so i think you know what i do try to do and it's not a tactic and it's it's i'm not doing this to 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 create a certain effect i do it because this is the way that I learn. When I'm learning, this is how I think, and that's why I teach this way. Whatever we learn in Torah, especially in Chassidus, it has to shed light on, on all of the human experience, including the most deep and dark aspects of, of, of being an embodied soul and everything that, that, that brings with it and all the, the difficulties and the, the, the real challenges. And, and when... My point is when we're capable of speaking about that deep, dark stuff in a way that's not sensational and it's not, you know, we don't make, we don't make it, um, shameful. We can, when, when we can speak about all of human experience with dignity, that itself, just that, that type of discourse alleviates a lot of the burden that people are carrying around with them. So Words. Yes. Yeah. Words. Yeah. Yeah. L literally that the words that we use and the way that we use them lightens people's load. It takes the, the, the weight off, it takes the pressure off. Hey there. In case this is your first time here at this channel, let me introduce myself. My name is Rabbi Chase Tao. What you were just watching was a clip from our annual live stream fundraising campaign from 2023. And uh, this is Soul Words. Soul Words is not just a YouTube channel. It's a virtual community where we get together to connect over the messages that are relevant to us in our lives, take spiritual concepts and bring them down into practical application. We're glad you're here and uh, we hope to connect to you here on this platform.